grocery store. So uh, you can go in there. It was like a butcher shop in the back. Carl would run the front of it, which was the, the grocery store. And if you needed rolls or you needed a pastry, you needed a cereal uh, or candy. It had a greatest selection of candy. <laughs> On the way to Kennedy Field, that was always a stop because you had to get your bazooka bubble gum uh, <laughs> to chew to go to Kennedy Field to play baseball all day. Uh, then... Uh, Next, uh, do you know um, where uh, the the shopping center? The, you've got like one. You've got like a um, a sushi restaurant, mm -hmm. and then a nail spa, and then an empty store right now. Right uh, before the big building uh, near the clock. That little where that little store that's empty. That was our post office. Oh. Uh, it was the second post office, I remember. The first post office, <clears throat> the, um, where the uh, veterinary uh, hospital is now mm -hmm. on Broadway, um, that years ago, uh, you had a, a barber shop. Um, it was a barber shop, I think, a, uh, some sort of a, a, a window door store. Mm -hmm. And then there was a little, little post office. And then the post office moved from there to where uh, this empty store is now. And then uh, <clears throat> it had to be uh, the 60s sometime mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the, the gentleman who owned the, uh, who owns the one, uh, a little shopping center on the corner of Livingston and um, an Irish name. Can't think of a very nice man. Um, um, he, uh, on the corner of uh, Livingston and Rockland Avenue, he owned the land on Railroad Avenue next to my father's property. And he is the one that built the new post office, which is the post office that we that we have we call it the, the, the people that have been here call it the new post office and it's got to be at least uh set 60 years old uh, <laughs> or pretty darn close to it so that's how the post office is uh, uh uh developed over over the years okay but okay. but basically um that area uh and where all the homes are built on uh, uh on uh, livingston street south of Broadway. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some homes that were there, maybe the first three, four or, or, or vintage homes. But from there down where you have the, uh, the, the, the small ranch house type of homes, that years ago was an open field. And the fire company used to run a, uh, a carnival every year. So the carnival that we have for the for the Norwood Public School, yeah, that's nothing new. That okay. carnival goes back into the 1950s. I love that. The that's interesting. Firemen would be down there every night with their with their hats on, <laughs> and their white shirts with their little badge and their blue pants, and they would be running all of the games and the rides. And it was like it was like a week long carnival that was used as a fundraiser. Uh, I don't remember where the money went uh, <laughs> for it, but um, the, the fire company has always, always been a vital cog in the, uh, in the uh, philanthropic uh, wheel of the town of Norwood. Uh, they, um, they have been giving out hot dogs for a real long time, uh, without a question. Good ones uh, too, and, I might add, at least for my limited time here. <laughs> yeah. uh, but basically, they, uh, the, the only homes that I remember further down uh, towards Blanche Avenue uh, was uh, the uh, Benequista family. Uh, Mr. Benequista had the home on, uh, on a Blanche and Livingston uh, that faced Blanche and his two sons uh, had homes uh, on Livingston facing the, uh, facing the, uh, the street, facing Livingston Street. And then there was a little where they where they have that empty lot now uh, on Livingston just before the Benequista homes. Uh, there used to be a little small red house that one of my classmates 
Arnold McDonald uh, hmm. lived in. And uh, he and his family lived there for years and years. And then after Arnold's uh, parents passed away and he was still in good health, <clears throat> uh, he lived there by himself. And I think eventually uh, he moved and uh, to uh, his stepsister's home in Creskill or Dumont. And then the, the building just became dilapidated and I don't know who ownership passed to, but those were really the, the only homes that were okay. uh, in the area. And then you, had, uh, then you had the Falkenstern family uh, right. living, on, uh, living on Blanche Avenue uh, and uh, the Falkenstern and extended Falkenstern family. <laughs> and then there was always Mrs. McNeely. Mrs. McNeely was the most famous first grade teacher yeah. in the town of Norwood's history. Let's and talk about she, her then. <laughs> Tell me uh, about her. <laughs> she, uh, she was a little short redheaded lady yeah. who, was like a, who was like an angel. She was so sweet. To kids that, for kids that had a self-image problem, mm -hmm. of which I was one of many, uh, she was just so nice. Uh, and she made going to school fun. And uh, she was very perceptive and uh, knew if you were having trouble, mm -hmm. knew what you could do and knew what you couldn't do. And she blended the two so that you had the most successful experience you possibly could have in her class. And um, she, um, the, the house that is on the corner of uh, Summit, and um, and Blanche mm -hmm. um, diagonally across from the Episcopal Church, uh, big old white home. Um, that was uh, that was the McNeely home, and she had in the house she had the most majestic um, uh, marble fireplaces that you've ever seen. Uh, there were white marble fireplaces. And they were on each of the floors. And that's how, in the early days of uh, pre-World War II, that the house was, be, uh, each fireplace had its own vent system into mm -hmm. the rooms it was located. And uh, that's how they heated the house pre-World War II. Oh, okay. Um, when Mr. and Mrs. McNeely got older uh, and passed away, uh, they had sold uh, the house to my father and they lived there to their death. And then uh, the house, uh, they had turned it into a two-family house at one point, and it maintained itself as a two-family house for a number of years until I sold it in the uh, in the eighties. Okay. Uh, and now a, a private owner now has it. But uh, basically, that was like um, the German Irish area of town. Okay. Uh, and then you had the Italian end of town up on this up on this side. So each of the sections very definitely developed uh, or maintained its mm -hmm. cultural heritage. Uh, you could come through this area uh, known as the patch and on Sundays you could smell spaghetti gravy uh, <laughs> cooking uh, on the on the stoves. Um, uh, the Beneguista home up on Summit Street I can remember that people would congregate there on Saturdays and Sunday afternoons uh, to go into the basement where it was cool. It was like a two steps down into their basement. You would have the ground two steps down into their basement, uh, which was um, like a, a small house in the basement. Uh, an, Italian, uh, an Italian cultural thing, you, you've got to live in the basement. Uh, and uh, basically, they would be in there eating and drinking wine and that, that type of thing. Um, in the um, in the Sposa, uh, where the Sposas lived, uh, and to this day, I, I still think they have some of the grapevines left uh, oh. in, uh, uh, in the Sposa, where uh, they were on um, Rockland and Summit, um, right on the corner. Uh, but... Uh, where those two homes or where the one big home is that faces uh, Summit Street now at Rockland, uh, that used to be a big, big garden. And when you were a kid, our school bus would pick us up there and you couldn't stand. I couldn't stand. I would walk around with my, with my shirt up around my nose uh, because they used to use uh, chicken manure 
to fertilize the ground oh, uh, wow. for the <laughs> garden. It had to be the worst, the worst. Yes. Snow. <laughs> and uh, so they had a massive garden there. Uh, and it was just a, it was, it was a sight to see when it was, uh, when it was blooming. Uh, but they also had uh, grapes uh, for the making of the wine. Everybody in this area uh, made wine or uh, other, uh, other libations uh, that weren't supposed to be made. You hear uh, that current residents? <laughs> we got to uh, step current up. Current residents, <laughs> libations were, were definitely made. And people would come from near and far throughout the town to sample the grappa and the barrels of wine. Uh, Norfail also. Uh, I wish we had a time machine. <laughs> uh, Norfail uh, also produced a heck of a lot of wine. Okay. There was a guy, um, I want to say his name was Bedrado, Freddie Bedrado. And uh, <clears throat> I can remember in our home on High Street, we had a, a kitchen downstairs. It wasn't anything fabulous, but a kitchen downstairs. Uh, and uh, Carlo Conti and Don Higgins and other guys that would hunt would go out and shoot quail mm -hmm. and uh, they would clean it and they would bring it to the house and uh, Mr. Bedrado would come down and uh, he not only was a plumber, but he uh, was a chef uh, in the, uh, in the uh, recreation resorts in, in the Catskills for many years. Yep. Uh, I think he was a boxer, if I remember correctly. Now, uh, now I'm listening. <laughs> uh, he, he, like had, he had like five million different jobs, and he was <laughs> proficient at all of them. But he would take the, uh, he would, the other thing he made was venison. That was unbelievable. Um, he would take the, uh, the uh, Cornish hens, mm -hmm. the peasants, and he would stuff them, put grapes in them, and then he would cook them in a wine sauce. And it was just absolutely spectacular, the eating. And then uh, the only two times I've ever seen my father drunk, uh, very honestly, was drinking red wine in the basement, eating Cornish hens. Uh, the other thing is that Mr. Boudreau used to make was uh, he was outstanding at cooking venison uh -huh. uh, and would cook uh, venison. Uh, um, I, I always felt it was very tough and gamey tasting. Right. And, um, it, uh, it left a lot to be desired. Uh, but when you ate his venison, it was just absolutely spectacular. Wow. So uh, the food was, uh, food was abundant. I almost rather just spend the rest of the time discussing culinary history of town <laughs> rather than political history, which I, which I thought I was going to be asking about. <laughs> uh, political oh, wow. history, huh. um, you know, the, 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 there, were, there were battles. Uh, I think it was only in the only in the most recent past, in the last 20, 30 years, that things really became polarized. I, I think, um, <clears throat> very honestly, in my own mind, I think uh, looking at the, the political history of the town, mm -hmm. we would be very wise uh, to consider uh, the, uh, the, the concept of term limits both uh, for mayors and, and councilmen. Okay. Uh, I, I think also uh, term limits uh, for employment of town administrators. Okay. Uh, I think what happens is, is that, um, and I think history proves it out. Um, people are not necessarily, um, uh, not necessarily um, biased Mm -hmm. uh, but I think they become indoctrinated into a particular train of thought when they stop and they stop being receptive to other ideas of, of management. And I, I really think in, in particular, in, uh, uh, I, it's very, very difficult for a town administrator uh, to, uh, to, not have strings attached uh, to the to the administration that they're working with. Right. Uh, it's based upon human nature. Uh, if you like somebody, you're going to say, "Okay, let's see." But I, I think decisions have to be made 
Uh, and I, I think if you, you take a look at what's going on in Washington right now, mm -hmm. uh, was Trump everything that you want in a president? No. And I'm a staunch, staunch Republican. Uh, <laughs> his, his manner, his manner of, of, he comes right out of the boardroom. And I think if most people have not been in a Fortune 500 boardroom, guess what? You saw it with Donald Trump. Uh, and I think from your legal background, you probably would, would be in somewhat in agreement uh, <laughs> to that. Um, everything comes down to either get the job done or you're gone, one or the other. Uh, this is my concept. It's my company, uh, my administration. This is the way it should be done. It can be a bit much at times, yes. Uh, I, I, I think um, for all the great things that Mr. Trump did, and I think uh, uh, if, if you get onto Fox News and uh, some of the people, uh, you know, he is not loved by Fox News. Let me tell everyone out there in TV land that that is definitely true. He's not loved <laughs> by Fox News uh, and by Fox Business News. But they, uh, Larry Kudlow, uh, is putting on some talks about what Trump was able and not able to accomplish. And I think when you take a look, a cold calculating look at what he did running the country from a business standpoint, unparalleled, unparalleled, be it in international affairs or within domestic economic questions. Um, you know, again, you know, we, we could have another conversation uh, about uh, the mannerisms that he that he employed. But guess what? Uh, Fortune 500 companies, first Boston Corporation. Um, um, anyone? Uh, can you imagine Henry Ford not uh, not acting the same way uh, when he was building his Ford Motor Company? Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's unfortunate. The polarization that's taken place, uh, I think we've lost. Um, you think it's come locally, you're saying, too? <clears throat> yeah, and I okay. think it's, it's filtered down, without question. I yeah. think one of the things that, that we've lost in town is that back in, the, back in the day, you could not start a baseball game on Sunday before 1 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And the reason why... It was at one o'clock was because the last mass of the day, the last service at the Presbyterian church or the Episcopal church was over by one o'clock. So I, I think we've lost a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, the values uh, that we were, or that we were taught, uh, at least my generation was taught as, uh, as children. Um, yeah. I think we've gotten into a uh, uh, my way or the highway. I'm right, you're wrong. Um, don't step on you know. You know, there's a lot to say for the flag that says "Don't tread on me." Uh, <laughs> there is very definitely, but at the same time, don't tread on me. But there's a thing called the Constitution that guarantees certain unalienable rights to all of us as we as we live our life the way we want to see it. Uh, the pandemic. Uh, should you wear a mask? Uh, yeah, damn right. You, you you should for your own safety and the person right. safety next to you. Not because somebody told you you have to, because it is the right thing to do. As a teacher, should we be? Should our kids be in school right now? Yes, because of the psychological damage that is being done to the kids, as well as the uh, the. Uh, the lack of uh, lack of academic work instruction. Uh, I could have stated that much more articulately, <laughs> but uh, I see where uh, you're going. <laughs> uh, it's uh, we pro probably have lost five years of preparation for these kids. Just the the natural maturation process that takes place. You're not going to get a hell of a lot of maturation playing Fortnite all day long uh, on uh, on your computer. And I can right, look at right. my grand, I can look at my grandson in Florida, and I can say that with a certainty. 
<laughs> but, um, you know, there, there has to be uh, reasonableness in the, in the things that we do. So I would say to you, Paul, that from a political standpoint, um, are parties needed in the town of Norwood? Yeah, probably because of the structure. Uh, are parties really useful? Not really, because everybody, it's a small enough town where um, Republicans and Democrats and independents uh, uh, cohabitate. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of families. If you take a look at the voting list, there are a lot of families with a Republican uh, wife or a Democratic husband and vice versa. Uh, yep. So basically, um, uh, it's a very diverse and uh, and uh, thought provoking group of people that we have in town. That but is true. But I, I, I think I think I I really do think that uh, term limits and uh, uh, non tenure non tenure in administrative positions for the town very very important. Tell um, me. Uh, order, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go right in. I was just going to circle back to you in particular as far as political history. How, how did you get involved? When did you start um, getting involved politically with the town? Basically, um, I was uh, I was upset by uh, a number of policies that had been implemented uh, when I first uh, came back to town. Mm -hmm. um, I thought. Uh, uh, I, I don't mind someone from the from the town sitting on a board uh, posing an objection to something or a way in which something uh, mandate a way in which something should be done. But when outsiders come in who step beyond the boundary of being a consultant, uh -huh. to being a manager, to being an administrator, to being a, uh, a person implementing policy, designing, uh, designing, implementing, and supervising policy. Uh, I think, you know, uh, originally when our country was founded and uh, we, uh, we got into an argument with, the, uh, with, the, with that king in England, uh, basically uh, we said to, uh, to the king and to the parliament, you have no right to govern us, only the people that are here living with us, that are a part of our community, have a right to govern us. No, you know we can be a part. Uh, you know, very there. There was a very and right in this area here uh, and during the Revolutionary War period, there were. Uh, this was a hotbed for Tories, and basically they wanted their independence, but they wanted to be a part of England. So there was a quasi relationship that the Tories on the whole saw. Uh, but then you had the, uh, the revolutionaries uh, who wanted to have the separation because of don't tread on me type of thing. And if, right. if you don't live with me here, if you're not here suffering through the same <laughs> ills that I am, uh, then you don't have the right to tell me how I'm going to do something or to tax me uh, right. for things that you've done that I have nothing to do with. Now, what, what year was it when you started to get involved because of that that sentiment? What, uh, I would what was have the time to frame say there? it was probably, <clears throat> um, I had been asked by the Republican Party back by Chubby Bocchino, uh, back in the uh, early 1970s, when I came, when I moved back to Norwood mm -hmm. and, and building our, our home here on High Street, uh, back in the early 70s to run for council, and I was coaching at Ramapo College and that type of thing, and I said, no, I I, I really don't have the time, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But then, <clears throat> as time uh, progressed, um, the frustrations built, and the frustrations built. And um, basically, I think it came down to a, a lack of, uh, <clears throat> of communication. We all blame things on communication or right. a lack of communication. <laughs> but uh, communication is a two-way avenue. And I think one of the most important things that people have to do is to treat others the way in which you want to be treated. And once you do that, then I think you have the ability 
to say some of the hard things that have to be said. Uh, but there has to be a uh, there has to be a camaraderie there, uh, a oneness that uh, we started to lose back in the back in the seventies, and I think that was a byproduct, very honestly, of the upheaval of uh, of the Vietnam War and the uh, the winding down of that, uh, the the first war that the nation had ever lost. And uh, no, uh, I have I have friends that I just my heart went out to when they came back uh, from uh, from Vietnam to be called a baby killer. Uh, and, you know, people, uh, um, uh, I was asked one day why uh, more guys my age weren't getting involved in the, uh, in the 4th of July parade. And I looked at the guy and um, it was a very close friend of my father's. And I said, you know, to be honest with you, why should they? I said, how have these guys been treated since they've come back from Vietnam? I was lucky. I had a, I had a medical injury and I was given a, a 4A uh, classification. Uh, that one, God forbid, everybody got killed in the field, I would get drafted and I'd be working in, a, in an office because uh, I have uh, uh, three pins in my back that, uh, in my leg that, uh, that caused problems with my back that led to my most recent back surgery. Um, so I was disqualified because of medical reasons. But these other guys that were, were sleeping in mud for 13 months, mm-hmm in rainstorms and getting shot in the middle of the night by snipers, um, they came back and they were not greeted home as, uh, as Americans. Uh, mm. And uh, the, the, the guys that came back from Korea weren't uh, overly loved. When they came back, they weren't recognized, but it was still better than what the Vietnam guys got. So wow. uh, my, my heart goes out to all the guys that are involved uh, with the various Vietnam organizations and why I'm glad to see uh, when my cousin died a, a couple of years ago or a few years ago now, uh, the, the funeral was just absolutely massive. And there were uh, uh, tons, just tons of uh, veterans from Vietnam that attended. He was a Marine uh, who spent uh, quite a bit of time on the other side of the DMZ, uh, separated from, uh, from American forces. And uh, for a number of months, no one knew where he was. So uh, these guys, uh, these guys really sacrifice life, limb, and mind, and uh, many of them are still suffering uh, the right. repercussions. So uh, uh, my heart goes out to them. So what? What was it? Gonna, when was your first uh, first term on the council? What year did you first get on? Oh, geez. I, I think uh, I think I had uh, three full terms. Uh, okay. The second and the third term was separated by about two years because of the open heart surgery I had. So okay. it was uh, it was um, uh, that was 2011. I had the open heart surgery, so I really got involved uh, actively uh, around 2006, seven, eight. Who was on the council uh, at the time? Um, uh, Tom Brizolara. Okay. Uh, um, Jim was then the uh, was then the uh, was a councilman and then became mayor when uh, when the mayor resigned to become a federal judge. Right, and that was Mary Kaplan. Uh, uh, yeah, yep. okay. Barry Barry Scott, um, uh, uh, Gert, Anthony Gercio uh, was on board. And um, I have to apologize. I can't remember the, the gentleman's name who went on the council with me from the uh, West Hill. He's now a, uh, <coughs> he was, uh, uh, he was a financial advisor at one point of his career and he just uh, turned complete, uh, complete uh, angle of movement on the, on his profession. Uh, he's now a, uh, a full-time EMT. Uh, working, I believe, at the Englewood Hospital. Uh, John Nikolai. John Nikolai. Yes, thank okay, you very much. Okay. Okay. <laughs> his name. Yeah. But uh, John and I came in at the same time. Okay. Uh, okay. For our first terms, uh, I put that first term in. Uh, then I had an interruption because of the uh, of the surgery, and then I came back for the uh, for the third term. I think, uh, very honestly, the the council should be limited uh, to. Uh, two to three terms. Mm. The mayor should be limited. Uh, so that new ideas and new blood, new perceptions 
uh, new directions uh, can be can be brought in. Uh, and I really think uh, the the whole concept of deal making uh, by the parties should be done away with. Uh, each party should be required uh, to put up a candidate for each seat, uh, which has not been the practice at times in the past. But I think that leads to uh, a amplification of potential problems with regard to decision making and freedom to make uh, decisions. What uh, what was the thing you were, you were proudest about about your time on the council during any of the terms? Uh, <clears throat> I'm pondering <laughs> without question. Uh, I think the thing that I was the proudest of was to take a a very open-minded view of people's problems when they came before the council. Yeah, I have to excuse myself. I'm, my throat, you've had me talking so long, my throat is killing me. <laughs> I'm just listening. <laughs> uh, I, had some, I had some stories in mind I, that I, I wanted I, to make sure I got you, but you gave me some other good ones. So I just let you go. <laughs> I, I think... Um, um, I have to honestly say <clears throat> that my uh, my heart and my soul went into um, each and every question that was brought before us. That's all you could ask from council people. Um, and I, I, Senator Carnally, uh, the the late Senator Carnally, who is who just died this past week, right, gave me some very very sage advice. Uh, uh, I had become very close with John McDonald, who was his uh, chief of staff for mm -hmm. a number of years. And both John and the senator said to me, the thing that you have to do is to listen and then to make decisions based upon not necessarily how you feel about something, but from what you've heard. Uh, for example, uh, I voted at one point, um, there was a uh, there was a, uh, a an administrator, uh, one of our people, full time employees, <clears throat> who had a son who applied for a job, and uh, he was being told that he couldn't apply for the job because his father would have been his boss. I said, "Wait a minute, just think about that." What are you saying to somebody? A kid who has grown up in town, mm -hmm. who saw his grandfather, his father, and many of their colleagues work for the town in this particular function, which is a very necessary function, mm -hmm. a very important one, a critical one, a highly technical one in reality. How could you tell this kid whose goal in life, his entire life, as to, to follow his grandfather and his father's footsteps and how proud he would be to be a part of that operation. How can you tell an American citizen that he is not eligible for a job because of his birthright? And very honestly, the, the law that was passed and my own party passed this law. This is locally? This is locally. My, okay. own party, okay. my own party passed this law that if you had, uh, there was a nepotism law that they, they put into effect. Right. And I said, but how can you do that? How does, how do I have the right or you have the right or anyone have the right to tell somebody in this country they are not free to do something? I, I said, it just does not make logical sense to me. So uh, we went back and forth <clears throat> and I had convinced uh, three other people on the council to join me. Okay. Oh, and we got it approved that the, the nepotism law was gone. I caught such holy hell 
<laughs> from, uh, from a number of people. Uh, and then I went about making phone calls and I sampled and I didn't realize, uh, I, I realized, but I didn't understand how deep the divide had become uh, within the town. And um, basically uh, the feeling was that the nepotism law was, was a good one. So I had to sit down and I had to really think of what I believe as an American citizen and what my constituency believes in may be two different things. And do I need to change my, to change my vote? And I brought it up some months later mm -hmm. and I changed my vote. And as a result, the entire action was reversed. My reversal was reversed. Okay. okay. But I, I think the, the young man was allowed to apply for the job. Right. And uh, the, the mayor asked us, each member of the council, uh, to, uh, to sit down and take a, a piece of yellow paper and put pros and cons for each candidate and to rate the three candidates that were applying. Unfortunately, this young man in our evaluation came to number three and wouldn't have gotten the job anyway. Okay, okay. Yeah, but the fact that uh, he was, an exception was made to the nepotism thing to allow him to apply or go through the first step of application Right. Uh, uh, he didn't become a, a, a finalist. He was a, a first step person. I felt that the rights of an American citizen were upheld. And, That's excellent. And as, and as a right of that upholding of his rights, I felt much easier with the decision right, to disqualify right. him for a job. Another time, um, uh, an employee got himself into some trouble. And uh, the trouble that he was involved in, uh, in essence, uh, was a systemic problem of our society. And it's, uh, it's rampant throughout our entire society. And uh, I was told that because of the nature of his job, he had to be held to a different standard. And I said, wait a minute. I, as a football coach, had a severe knee operation. Part of that treatment was the use of Oxycontin. Mm -hmm. And I needed the Oxycontin because of the severe pain for about three months. When it came time to get off the Oxycontin, I couldn't get off it. I had to, I spoke to my doctor, Dr. Barquell, I said, how do I do this? He said, Frank, you take a little bit, you take a full, you take a full tablet tonight. You take a half a tablet the next time you use it. Then you take another half a tablet, another half a tablet, and then you take a quarter of a tablet. And then I, I, I swear to you, Paul, my body was just screaming. Uh, for the uh, for the drug, but I was able to work my way off it. This person um, was was not in Norwood. Uh, I'm not going to get into any more of where he was because then everybody will know what's what's going on here. Right. But um, basically, um, <clears throat> he was being held to a different standard. How could you hold him to a different standard? when this severe problem that besets our country besets every social economic category that we, that we have. Right. And uh, we went through, uh, we, we brought in a, a, a mediator. Uh, we paid him uh, 500 and some odd dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, we did this and we did this. We spent money. People were, uh, you know, were, were, were polarized on the issue. And I felt that I had to 
say something, do something. And I, I slammed my phone down on the desk. And I said, you guys have to be kidding me. How could you make this decision when this is a human being? I said, we hired him because we thought he was the best guy for the job. We brought him in. We've spent a tremendous amount of money to, uh, uh, to prepare him for his job. We've trained him. We've done this. We've done that. But more than even that, <clears throat> more than the dollars and cents, he's one of us. And we should have the responsibility to take care of one of us. If, he, if, we, if we take the responsibility to make sure he gets the necessary, um, uh, necessary factors to, to get beyond his problem, um, and he does it again, then yes, right. should be fired. But we, and, and I'll tell you, I, 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 I talked to state senators, Paul. Mm -hmm. I made phone calls to Trenton. Uh, thank you to, uh, to Holly uh, Shapizi and to Senator Carnally uh, for, uh, for putting me into contact with these people. Mm -hmm. I spoke with uh, people that were responsible or the type of organization he was working in uh, at both the federal, the state and the local levels. Uh, I even spoke to the FBI and asked how they handle these types of things. And it's not the dogmatic cut the wire type of thing. And I would not have been able to sleep with myself if I had not taken the task of trying to save this young man's career. And uh, for that, uh, I, I got a lot of shit, <laughs> if, I, if I may say. Sure. Uh, but I have, to, I have to say that I was very proud of that. Um, as far as you know, the, the more mundane types of things, uh, um, uh, I was really uh, proud of the uh, of the uh, the Christmas uh, the Christmas parade. Uh, that was a, that's we, always good. Yep, we really had it going, and uh, I, I I thought that um, the uh, the development of the the recreation facilities uh, where all people uh, have an opportunity uh, to take part in the community and participate. What I would what I would love to see is to uh, to start erasing labels and titles. Um, and la I shouldn't say titles because you need titles because of <laughs> the scalar chain of command, but uh, labeling. Um, I, I could see that, yeah. And, and there's some councils that do that already. They're, they're, they're already run by a party. It's just it's sort of like school board in some towns, but yeah. let me... Um, I only have a few minutes left and you've been more than gracious with your time already. I want to give you my favorite segment to, to close this out, which you'll probably enjoy too. Give me uh, your best recollections. I call it Norwood Notorious, something that really stands out in your mind, scandalous, entertaining, either from before your time, during your time. One thing I remember that you told me about was uh, an arsonist, but uh, I don't know if you want to talk about him on camera or not. But. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about the young man that used to go around and uh, putting uh, uh, starting fires in uh, garbage uh, garbage receptacles? I thought it was a guy that lived by himself in like the woods. Oh or something. yes, okay, yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what, he was a scary individual. Um, when was he around? And just tell me about him, even if you don't want to use his name. That's a story uh, I always loved that you told me early on. He was simply known as the Russian. Okay, uh, Maxi the Russian. He wore these long, um, long rubber boots all the time. And he looked like he was coming out of the tundra of, uh, <laughs> of uh, Siberia uh, and would drink vodka all the time. My father and he were, were friends. And uh, whenever my father had a load of, uh, of wood from a job, he would drive it over to, uh, to Maxie's place. Uh, and uh, he would use that to heat his home. Uh, and it was a little house uh, off. Um, uh, if you go down uh, broad, uh, Broadway into West Norwood, 
as you start going down the hill uh, towards Old Tapan, uh, there's like a, 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 a dirt roadway. It's now a driveway, but it was a roadway. And it's still there um, that would go bar- back off into the woods. And there was a house way back there. And that's where Maxie lived. Uh, but Maxie, uh, Maxie had uh, the ability, if one needed to, uh, to use uh, vodka huh. to start fires. And uh, every once in a while, there would be a mysterious fire someplace. And you would often wonder if, uh, if Maxie was, uh, was involved or not. But uh, that, uh, that, that would be the, the, the scandal. Okay. Uh, okay. Give me one exciting, more for the road. Yeah, or exciting. The, the one exciting last thing. one last quality Norwood anecdote for the road. Uh, <laughs> and I could go for hours with you. We just scratched the surface. I might have to have you back at some point. You know what? I, I think <laughs> a few years ago, we had a 4th of July ceremony. Uh-huh. Uh, we, had, uh, we had a band on the bandstand. And we brought in the... Uh, fireworks and we had ice cream people and food people and uh we had i can't remember what jeff craples told me but there had to be ten thousand plus people Hmm. in the in the area from kennedy field uh to uh to summit street Uh uh on all the roadways and byways uh, everything was packed with people sitting in the middle of the street wow. on the sidewalks on, uh, on Livingston Street watching the fireworks. It was probably one of the most well-attended uh, fireworks celebration, 4th of July parties we've ever had. Uh, I can remember as a, as a little kid, uh, 4th of July, <clears throat> there would always be a 4th of July picnic on High Street. And uh, everybody on this end of High Street and everybody on that end of High Street uh, and much of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Hudson Avenue, especially the Bokino side of Hudson Avenue and the Escalisi side of Hudson Avenue, uh, and the fork, we would set up in front of the Falkensterns. Mm-hmm. Uh, my uncle Rocky was directly across the street from the Falkensterns' home, uh, and uh, you would use the homes for the bathrooms. Uh, they actually one year uh, was, was so big that they actually had they brought in the uh, little uh, porta johns. But uh, basically, uh, we would uh, we would go to the Fourth uh, of July parade. Then we would have a picnic on the grounds uh, of the Falkensterns had uh, like uh, a big a big field on on High Street and another big field where uh, where the bank is now on on Livingston and we would play softball games fathers against sons mixed teams that type of thing and then at night everybody would go down to Kennedy Field and uh and watch the fireworks that might be my favorite annual tradition in town since i've been here and we yeah. got here in 2000 uh, and uh, a big part of that always was the uh the firemen uh uh before the uh american legion began doing this the firemen uh would have hot dogs for the entire town uh at the firehouse and you couldn't wait to get back to get the hot dogs <laughs> and years later the american legion uh, uh, started to uh, give away the hot dogs also. Mm. So uh, it was amazing. Uh, excellent. Well, uh, like it's I said, I, I, with you. what's that? It's been a pleasure being with you. I, I, I could go for another several hours, but uh, I know I got people waiting to go somewhere today. So and I don't think my wife is going to be too happy with me being on this. Plus, I've got to go back and do some more football stuff. Yep, to yep. Get those uh, emails out. Well, I might have to bring you back because there's a couple of things we left open that I'd love to discuss further. But uh, I thank you for everything today. Okay. And just, and just for the record, this is the man that got me started thinking council a couple of years ago. So it's your fault. <laughs> oh, I'm going to be honest with you. You would have ran for dog catcher back then. You wanted to be an official. <laughs> now, as a matter of fact, uh, what's her name? The lady that was in charge of the uh, in charge of the uh, environmental commission. Christine She's now Hagen. in Nebraska. Yep. She uh, she is the one that lab- put that label on you. 
that uh, you just wanted to participate. And I'll tell you why you've been a you've been a a mainstay in uh, in the town's operation without question. You brought a a real balance to the council and uh, a lot of hard hard work uh, for nothing. Uh, for the uh, for the environmental commission and and in essence uh, you help save uh, uh, our our environment in in the town uh, we if we didn't stop that uh, that scourge on the trees uh, we would have been a barren uh, a barren community uh, if not left unchecked uh, thank you so I thank congratulate you. you for your work and I need you for yours you go back a lot further than I do here so you you've earned it as well. <laughs> But, Have a uh, great day. You too. Now, how do I shut this off? How do I shut this off?